We are on, this is Glenn Lauer with The Glenn Show, bloggingheads.tv. I'm a professor of economics and of public and international affairs here at uh, Brown. And I'm with the Watson Institute uh, at Brown, which sponsors The Glenn Show. And my guest uh, today is Scott Gerber. He's a professor of law at Ohio Northern University uh, Law School, and he's also a visiting scholar from time to time here at Brown. That's how I got to know Scott. Scott has been on uh, The Glenn Show before talking about Justice Clarence Thomas and other stuff. And we're going to be talking about Justice Clarence Thomas here today. Uh, there is a book out there by the political scientist Corey Robin. The book is called The Enigma of Clarence Thomas. Um, and we will get to that. Uh, Scott has written a review of the book. Uh, we've read the book and uh, have been wanting to discuss it for months, but have only now found the time to do so. But Scott is a law professor. And as it happens yesterday, law professors, was it yesterday or the day before, law professors we're up there at Capitol Hill at the uh, House, uh, 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 what is it, the Judiciary Committee hearings yes. on uh, impeachment of, uh, of uh, President Trump. And law professors were testifying. Uh, Noah Feldman of Harvard, uh, Pamela Carlin of Stanford, uh, Jonathan Turley of Georgetown, if I'm not mistaken. George Washington. George Washington University Law School were um, a panel of uh, legal scholars testifying, and Scott being a legal scholar and impeachment being in the air, it seemed to behoove us to uh, at least address our attention to that issue. How did you um, how did you react to the testimony of your colleagues up uh, at the Judiciary Committee uh, earlier this week? Well, the first thing I'll say is of the four, only Michael Gerhardt at the University of North Carolina Law School is an expert on impeachment. He's written two books about it. And Pam that's, Carlin, the one, that's the one whom I never heard of. <laughs> yeah. Um, Pam Carlin, uh, who was on the faculty at the University of Virginia Law School when I was a student there and has since moved on to Stanford, she's not an expert on impeachment. She's uh, a voting rights uh, person. And then um, uh, Jonathan Feldman. Turley. Jonathan Turley isn't an expert on it either. Neither is Noah Feldman. So they don't necessarily uh, know what they're talking about. Okay. Well, what what do you think? Do you know what you're talking about? You're not an expert on impeachment either, are you? Uh, well, I've written about it. In my first book, I have a section on um uh, checks on the court. My book is about constitutional interpretation, my very first one, but impeachment also obviously can be used against the president of the United States. And so I did research it and learn about it, and I've written an article about it and the like. So uh, I know at least something about it. But what, what do you think? In terms of just generally, you know, should he impeach or what is the standard? What do the terms mean? Which? Which what's which part? Well, I mean, two things. There is the large issue. Should he be impeached? And then there is the process issue of the role that law professors testifying before the Judiciary Committee plays in the deliberation about whether or not he should be impeached. Yeah. I mean, as I said in a local TV interview I did after that. Uh, law professors are very political. Academics are very political people. And so all they were doing is was dressing up their personal opinions uh, as academic theory. And when they're not experts on it, with the exception of Michael Gerhardt, uh, I don't take it seriously. I mean, I, I, I knew Carlin was going to say he needs to go. I knew Noah Feldman was going to say he needs to go. And, you know, that sort of thing. So I, I didn't take it seriously. You didn't have to watch it to know what they were going to say. Do, do there exist law professors who are conservatives? I mean, in the kind of partisan sense that Pamela Carlin is a progressive or a liberal? Not enough. Maybe five. <laughs> Maybe five. You know, and I'll, I'll just give you a little personal anecdote. When I was going through the, you know, the tenure process at my law school, and I got it unanimously, but, you know, one of my colleagues was, you know, given a little grief occasionally um, because I'm not on the left. And so, you know, after listening to this for a couple of years, uh, the dean uh, stopped the person and he later relayed this anecdote. And he said, it's okay if there are five or six conservative constitutional law professors in the United States, and it's okay if we have one of them. 
<laughs> okay, so, that, so you are identifying yourself as a conservative law professor. I want to know what you think about uh, the House of Representatives evidently uh, about to draft articles of impeachment, uh, you know, uh, for uh, President Trump. Uh, does that seem to you to be uh, justified on the evidence as uh, far as you understand it? What, what exactly is he being impeached for? Abuse of power, quid pro quo, uh, using his powers as president in order to further his own personal political interests, uh, uh, withholding uh, aid and uh, distorting our relations with um, an ally and uh, uh, somehow despoiling our position in the global uh, competitive uh, environment with our adversaries just so that he can get reelected. This is a no-no. Uh, shouldn't be done. If the House doesn't act, it will be failing to live up to its constitutional responsibilities. Uh, it'll be sending the wrong message to future presidential administrations. Uh, we're talking here about the rule of law. Nobody is above it, even somebody who manages to win account in the Electoral College. Uh, isn't the House doing what it needs to do right now? No, that all sounded good. And I know that you're trying to be uh, a, a fair and impartial moderator. He's being impeached for two things, Glenn. One, for winning the 2016 election. They didn't like that. And for the fact that he's probably going to win the 2020 election also. They're freaking out. They're freaking out. Look at the Democratic candidates for president. They got nobody, right? He's going to win. And they just can't stand it. And they can't stand the fact that he won in 2016. And, you know, I wrote an op-ed about this two years ago, and I called it anatomy of a witch hunt. And I know the phrase the witch hunt is, is President Trump's phrase, but he's correct about that. And what I did was just trace through chronologically just the constant attempts to unsettle the election from 2016. So even before he was, um, uh, uh, the Electoral College had convened, someone wrote an op-ed in the Baltimore Sun saying that the electors had to you know, change their yeah. votes so he wouldn't get it. And Richard Cohen, who's a, a famous uh, left leftist columnist for the Washington Post, on January 9th, he wrote a January 9th, 2017, he wrote a column about how we need to impeach Donald Trump. Donald Trump didn't become president until 11 days after that, and he was also already talking about impeaching the man. He hadn't even taken the oath yet. And it just went on and on and on. You probably remember the 25th Amendment nonsense where the, they argue that he's, you know, mentally unstable and all mm -hmm. of that stuff. And they just, tr they try anything. They just throw it up on the wall. And the Ukraine stuff is no different than that. It's just the latest version of the same old thing. Okay, well, let me carry on in my devil's advocate role here. That's my job. You sound like Sean Hannity over there, Scott Gerber. I mean, you sound like an advocate. Uh, uh, let's get down to cases. You heard the, did you read the transcript of the telephone call that he had with uh, uh, President yes, Zelensky? Yes, sir. Did you not hear him say uh, in so many words, I can't quote it because I don't have it in front of me, but did you not hear him say, uh, I'm going to be sending my attorney general your way. Uh, I've got my personal lawyer, uh, 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 Mayor Giuliani, who was uh, uh, looking into some matters. We'd really appreciate it if you could do some help for us. Didn't you hear him say that? If you could do help for us by looking into corruption and specifically, Joe Biden is running around talking about how he got an investigation shut down just by uh, stomping his foot. Uh, that is very disturbing. Uh, his son's uh, relationship to that company over there, Burisma, uh looks fishy to us. We don't know what's going on. And by the way, uh, in the 2016 election, we have reason to believe that there was some Ukrainian involvement. Uh, there's a missing server somewhere. Maybe we could hunt it down. Would you mind looking into that? Didn't I mean, those are things that he actually said. Uh, and it is intimated, it's alleged by the Democrats that he said it with the implicit threat that if you want to visit to the White House Oval Office with me, giving you my imprimatur, and if you want uh, assistance with military uh, equipment and financing to be able to stave off, uh, uh, you know, uh, unrest and whatnot that's fomented by Russia, then you'd better play ball. Yeah, you, as usual, you've said a lot, and it's all and it's all 
interesting and it's all provocative. So I'll just take pieces of it as I recall uh, what you said in your narrative there. Um, first of all, as, uh, as you mentioned to John McWhorter, um, his, his comment, can you do me a favor, wasn't about uh, this part. It was about something else. So don't forget that. And then we also have a treaty with uh, the Ukraine. The Ukraine is notoriously corrupt. And we have a treaty about that to try to prevent that. Okay. And so the president has, has the duty, frankly, to be concerned about corruption in a country that we're given aid to, to make sure that it goes for the purposes that uh, it should be going. So there's that kind of thing. And, you know, and frankly, the person who should be worried and, and all of that is Joe Biden. Joe Biden is the one that actually um, uh, 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 did this quid pro quo kind of thing. So he's he's the bad actor here, not Trump. And confessed so to it in public, that's... sitting right next to Richard Haas of the Council of Foreign Relations at a public meeting. Biden says, uh, son of a bitch. I told him that it's, uh, the change had better happen before I got on my plane in six hours. And what do you know? They they fired the prosecutor. Otherwise, they weren't going to get the money that I had control over. That's what Joe Biden said. Right. I'm just you know reaffirming what? you. Right. And, you know, the, the, the left never mentions that. But I'll, I also want to say a couple of other things. One, uh, pres- the president of the Ukraine himself said there was no pressure yeah. to do an investigation. That's of course a, he did. Game, game over for me. Number two, an investigation was not done. Number three, he got to meet with the president. And number yeah. four, yeah. they got the money. Yeah, okay. Now you're sounding like David Nunes, but I hear you. <laughs> I mean, I should just say for the record, if people didn't see my conversation with John McWhorter about this or my conversation with uh, Stephen Tellis, the political science at Hopkins about this, uh, I'm not all that enthusiastic at all about this impeachment uh, inquiry. I think it's terrible. For, this is Glenn Lowry. I'm not a law professor. Make of this what you will. Terrible for the country. Just terrible. Horrible precedent. Believe me, we have not heard the last of this, okay? These chickens will come home to roost against a Democratic president at some point, perhaps in the foreseeable future. Uh, Very bad for the institutions. I mean, supposing your hypothesis is correct, that this is really about losing in 2016 and anticipating the loss in 2020, then the idea that you would try to override the outcome of the electoral process once you get control of one house of Congress that you would hold up the nation's business, that you would vilify the person whose um, effective exercise of their powers of office affects the well-being of 330 million people. You try to undercut him. You try to weaken him. You try to stymie him at every turn. You try to undermine his illegitimacy. You talk about getting rid of the Electoral College. You'd you'd say that the uh, election was stolen by his uh, crafty misuse of his powers of office inviting foreigners to interfere. And so this is terrible, okay? If indeed it's politically motivated, if it's an end run around politics, if it's a substitute for winning Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and Michigan and North Carolina and Florida, and et cetera, you can't do that, so you're gonna do this. If that's what's going on, that is absolutely horrible. Okay, so I'm not the least bit enthusiastic of an election. You didn't say this, but I know you think it. An election is less than a year away. Let the people decide who's going to be their president. This is not so clear a set of offensive. Even if I buy the judgment that he misused the powers of his office, it's not so egregious an offense that you should remove somebody from an elected office as the chief executive of the country because that did that thing. You could censor him and then move on. This could have been over uh, months ago. But, uh, you know, uh, here we are. So that's what I think for what it's worth. You all can make of that what you will. I'm not a lawyer, but it, it strikes me as, as a circus. Uh, and, I, and I have to tell you, I don't know where the Democratic uh, consultants are. Did you see Nancy Pelosi yesterday or day before making her announcement? that uh, the House was actually going to proceed, uh, she was going to have the Judiciary Committee go forward to draft articles of impeachment. Or Jerry Nadler, 
who got caught falling asleep in his seat. Did you see that? No, perhaps if you don't watch Sean Hannity, you didn't see it. Or Tucker Carlson. I actually tuned in to Tucker Carlson and Sean Hannity last night. Yes, I admit it. Precisely because I wanted to see how they were going to handle it. And they had a long uh, uh, a series of uh, video uh, capturing uh, Gerald Nadler, the New York City congressman who chased the Judiciary Committee, falling asleep during the testimony. I'm not making that up. I'm not making that up, okay? Uh, Adam Schiff is perhaps in Burbank a very attractive and compelling figure. But I would imagine in much of America, and not all of it red America, uh, he is uh, a less than compelling figure, a hyper-partisan, can't-be-trusted uh, kind of, uh, I don't want to, I'll stop at that. I mean, less than compelling. So yes. politically, I don't know how this can work out to the benefit of Democrats, because it looks like they're putting forward to the American people, instead of being able to say, we've got a new trade deal with Mexico and Canada, instead of being able to say, we're going to build some bridges, dig some tunnels and fix some roads, and instead of being, <laughs> being able to say, we're actually going to grasp the nettle of the problem of immigration uh, uh, illegal immigration and do something about it that's consistent with our values and also in our interests. We're going to split the difference or whatever it is we have to do and make and move the needle on that thing. Instead of doing all this stuff, they're doing this, which uh, I don't see how it works out to their political benefit. You're not going to remove Trump from office. We know what it's a foregone conclusion that uh, the Senate is going to uh, refuse to remove it from office. Um, and you're in a hurry. That's the other thing. This is what Jonathan Turley, and I'll stop, was saying during his testimony. He says, what's the hurry? That This is impeachment that we're talking about here. You need to build the case. You need to build the case. Now, they want to go ahead because some of the evidence they want, the documents and the witnesses, are, are being held back, and they'd have to go to court, prevailing court, in order to be able to get these people in front of their hearings, uh, and that would take months. They don't, they don't want to be sitting in June still trying to impeach a president so I, I don't know. Doesn't you know? So there, yeah. there you are. Yeah. yeah, you said again. You said a lot there, and I, I just want to react to a couple of the points. Please one, do. okay. One, I don't have TV at my house, so I don't watch Sean Hannity. I don't watch CNN, MEC, none of that. So I actually okay. don't have TV. So um, I don't know what Sean Hannity says or does not say. Of course, okay. I know who he is. All right. So there's that. Um, and I, I agree with your most important point. This is this is terrible for the country. I mean, you, you cannot impeach the president of the United States based on speculation, gossip, hearsay and partisanship. He's the president of the United States. OK, and you're right. You have to. And Turley was right about this. You have to be careful about this. Again, he's the president of the United States. So there's that. Also, uh, the, the president is justifiably upset, angry, whatever you want to call it, because this has been going on for three years, this kind of stuff. And one of the other points you made to John McGuirter was, this is the Mueller stuff all over again. They're just yeah. talking about something different. They couldn't get him with that. Now let's try this. And it's the same old stuff. And at some point, enough is enough. And so I don't blame him for he's trying to get some work done. What is Congress doing, Glenn? What kind of laws are con is Congress passing? What is what is the House doing? What do they ever do? So there's that. I mean, we're we're at peace in the United States with the rest of the world. We're, the economy is, and this is your area, the economy is doing great. Yeah. The stock market's doing great, right? So yeah. apparently, even though no president, including President Trump, should take full credit for how well the economy does, how well the stock market does, he should at least get some, just like every other president did when it was doing well. Believe me, if they were tanking, he'd be getting blamed. Right. And on, on Adam Schiff, he, <laughs> talk about someone with an agenda. He, he was lying about certain things. 
And then last but not least, you know, you, you said I sounded like a Trump defender and all of that. What's driving me in this and what drives me in almost everything I do is I just want people to be treated fairly, fairly, right? Including Donald Trump. He's not being treated fairly. They're saying, for example, that he's uh, obstructed justice because he hasn't turned over documents or let some of his um, uh, advisors uh, uh, testify before Congress. He's allowed to seek protection in the courts first to decide whether they have to do that stuff because he knows they're trying to get him. Yeah. He's entitled to fight back. And that's what he's really, really, really good at. There's been no president that I can recall that has been a, as good at fighting back at counterpunching than he is. And that's all he's doing. That's not obstructing justice. That's just using the judicial process to protect his rights and uh, because uh, he's allowed to do it. That's my take on that. Now, let me make an observation, uh, which is that uh, I find persuasive your claim that you're not being a partisan. You're just trying to advocate for fairness. Now, people can have different opinions about that. But the thing that I find startling is that you are virtually alone amongst uh, legal scholars, not entirely alone. I mean, Alan Dershowitz, for example, has spoken out. You can probably name others. Uh, I'm talking about scholars. I'm talking about people who are actually in the academy doing uh, legal scholarship and teaching, um, speaking out uh, on the president's behalf uh, in this situation, precisely emphasizing issues of fairness and uh, process and um, and all the rest. Uh, why is that? Why is that? You, you've been in academia longer than me. You know why that is. Academia is uh, far left. It's not merit-based. So if you don't think like they do, or if you don't check the right boxes, uh, you're going to have a tough road to hoe. Um, and, you know, m my road personally has been kind of tough. I mean, I'm prolific. I've got nine books. You know, I don't even know how many articles, all of that stuff. If and, you do say and, so yourself. If I do say so myself. And they're actually quite well received. But, <laughs> you know, I had a heck of a time. Uh, finding yeah. the job. And but for the fact that my law school at the time was on probation with the accrediting body for not having enough of the faculty publishing, I wouldn't have even gotten a, this job. Yeah. So that, well, you that's know that uh, there have been public calls that Jonathan Turley should be fired at George Washington University because of the fact that he went up there. He didn't even testify on behalf of the president. He just asked the Congress to slow down and build a factual case before they went. I don't think uh, Turley is a Trump supporter, actually. Yeah, I don't either. But there's nevertheless been calls for his head on a platter. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, 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 John, you uh, back in the day, uh, they, yeah. they asked uh, Berkeley to revoke his tenure because he was a quote unquote war criminal. And to his credit, the dean at the time, Christopher Edley, told those people to go jump on the lake. So uh, and he was on the left. But, you know, yeah, I know Chris Edley. He's definitely on the left. He was in Carter administration back in the day. Uh, and you, what did you do? Oh, was the torture memo stuff? Right. Yeah. So, oh, all right, uh, impeachment is going to proceed no matter what you and I say. <laughs> uh, I predict that the House of Representatives will have uh, voted out uh, articles of impeachment by a party line, uh, pretty much solidly party line uh, vote before uh, Christmas. And uh, it'll be in the Senate uh, after the first of the year and we'll see what happens. Uh, I think we know what's going to happen and then we'll take it from there. Okay, let's talk about Corey Robin. Uh, should I let me let me take a couple of minutes to summarize what I got out of reading Corey Robin's book, The Enigma of Clarence Thomas. Robin is a man of the left. He very self consciously uh, left liberal uh, political science uh, person. He's worried about. Uh, uh, he, he he very much uh, dislikes that Donald Trump was elected president. And believes that that's a re-establishment of the. Uh, uh, white supremacy that we thought we might have gotten past earlier in the 20th century. Uh, he doesn't at all like uh, the neoliberal kind of pro-capitalist 
uh, ideas that animate many people, uh, including Clarence Thomas, uh, when they think about uh, regulation, uh, property rights, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the way in which the law impacts on the economy and whatnot. Uh, uh, he feels that that uh, robs the polity of the ability through politics to have control over processes that are dramatically affecting our lives, like processes that engender inequality. Um, and uh, he is uh, an integrationist, I guess I'd have to say, although uh, uh, I'm not entirely certain about that, but very suspicious of the uh, black nationalist sentiments that animate Clarence Thomas's uh, 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 understanding about race relations. Uh, so he's written a book. Uh, the book uh, falls into three sections, a section on race, a section on capitalism, and a section on the Constitution. Each section of the book consists of three chapters which spell out an argument. In the race section, the argument is Clarence Thomas, in the main, is driven by his ideas about African-American uh, identity and black nationalism. Clarence Thomas is a pessimist about the project of bringing about a world in which uh, racism would no longer prevail. Clarence Thomas thinks race is a natural, inescapable fact about American society, and racism is likely to be with us for a very long time, and that black people's correct approach to the problem of racial domination is to consolidate, to develop their own institutions, and to uh, strengthen themselves and take care of themselves and not to rely upon government or the largesse of white people. Thomas is a nationalist, much influenced by Malcolm X. And that you can see in his early life and writings, and uh, Robbins goes through that. But Robbins thinks that it uh, pretty much, prof that very profoundly determines how Thomas approaches the law. That's race. On capitalism, Thomas is a black conservative. He, Robbins, that is, places Thomas in uh, the same category as someone like Thomas Sowell, uh, the scholar at Hoover Institution, the African-American uh, octogenarian. He's been around for a very long time, very prolific writer uh, and uh, uh, a conservative. Uh, and George Schuyler, the late uh, George Schuyler, who was a social critic uh, who wrote during the early and middle part of the 20th century, an African-American conservative journalist. And uh, all three of these gentlemen, Clarence Thomas, Thomas Sowell, and George Schuyler, started out on the left. <laughs> Thomas Sowell, the free market Listen. economist, was a Marxist, literally. Uh, Clarence Thomas was himself uh, much left of center earlier in his, uh, uh, in his intellectual development. And Schuyler, I don't know that much about his intellectual history, uh, was, uh, that's S-C-H-U-Y-L-E-R, was uh, also a man of the left. And they moved right. And Robbins sees a pattern in that, uh, a pattern that you could identify with the likes of a Booker T. Washington. Uh, this is the great uh, conservative African-American leader of the late 19th, early 20th century, who basically said, uh, let's not worry about integrating with white people. Let's develop institutions that enhance the uh, capacities of black people to take care of ourselves. This is Booker T. Washington, who basically said, let's not go around demanding rights. Let's make ourselves sufficiently productive and uh, admirable as persons such that we would deserve rights, this kind of thinking. This is what he identifies uh, as a root of Thomas's black nationalism. He thinks it affects, and I'll stop because uh, you're actually the expert on this. I just want to summarize the book, how I understand the book. Uh, with respect to capitalism, uh, uh, Thomas is a free market. Uh, the state is ineffective. Uh, if you want to produce an outcome, relying on bureaucracy and government to get it for you is not the way to go. And, it matter, and as a matter of fact, if you want uh, the prosperity of black people, relying on regulation, law, and government is, uh, is not the way to go. Not at the end of the day. Uh, at the end of the day, the way to go is to rely on the uh, dynamics of capitalism to open up opportunity and the capacities of African-Americans to make themselves fit to take advantage of that opportunity. Um, and then he has this uh, uh, section of the book that's about the Constitution, the white Constitution and the black Constitution. I'll let you expand on this, but that's the book, race, capitalism, and the Constitution. Thomas is an enigma. Why is Thomas an enigma? 
Well, because he brings to the Supreme Court the confluence of all of these forces. Uh, African-American man who came up tough in a racially segregated and racist society, but who made it through. A man whose ascendancy to the Supreme Court was almost stopped by the accusation that he had been sexually harassing somebody. Um, a, a man who has expressed publicly his concerns about the effects of dependency on welfare, on the nature of the black family, on African-American masculinity and the prerogatives of African-American men, uh, and so on. Thomas is this enigma because he embodies these different forces. A man who thinks race is an implacable force in society, but nevertheless who believes that the Constitution is colorblind and race should play no formal role in the uh, uh, application or interpretation of the Constitution. Um, and uh, he attempts, that is Robbins, and I'll stop, to read the many, many opinions that Clarence Thomas, who is the longest serving member of the United States Supreme Court, 28 years and counting, and he's only, what, 72 or 73 years old, Clarence Thomas? Um, he could be there for another 15 years, and if so, he will have been the longest serving member of the United States Supreme Court in the history of this great country, uh, who has written, you know, many, many opinions. Some uh, sessions of the court, his, he's the most prolific uh, issuer of opinions <coughs> amongst all the members of the court. <clears throat> whose clerks have spanned out, especially with the election of another Republican president, to occupy important roles in the federal judiciary and in the administrative state, <clears throat> as well as in the media. Uh, he's having an enormous impact on American life. Clarence Thomas is probably the most influential member of the U.S. government in the history of this country who is an African-American. Uh, and so Robin attempts to situate this great man and this profound biography and this, uh, uh, this long shadow that he's casting over American law and, and American governance uh, in the context of his biography. So having given that, I think we deserve, uh, the author deserves that, to know that we've actually read his book before we trash it. <laughs> I, turn it over, I turn it over to you, Scott, to tell me what's wrong with all of that. <laughs> because you've written a very well, influential uh, review. I mean, a very uh, uh, informative and persuasive review is what I mean to say. It should be influential. You can tell people about it. Uh, I read it, and I thought uh, it was extremely thoughtful and devastating to the argument of this book. But I, I, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, in terms of the impact of the review, I'm not a big social media person, but it, it has um, a lot of shares, you know, almost a thousand shares. That's pretty good, I think. That's yeah, what my students no doubt tell that's me. good. That's, that's good. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, my, my take on uh, Corey Robin and my take on the book, I didn't know who Corey Robin was. Uh, I was actually... Um, uh, just talking to you in your office um, uh, one time, and you had asked me if you would. I had seen this, heard about this book that was coming out because you had been asked to write a review of it for, I believe, First Things, and so uh, I, I hadn't. And um, and then I went and listened to a podcast about with him about this forthcoming book at the time, and now it's been out for a couple of months. And it just seemed bizarre to me what he was saying. And so I then went upstairs, you know, when I was at the Political Theory Project and asked our mutual friend Dan D'Amico uh, if he knew who this person was. And uh, he didn't, but he, he looked at the faculty webpage and it was clear to Dan that he was a Marxist because of what he wrote about and where he placed his, his articles and the like. And so then I was asked to write the review of the book. It took me forever to get a copy of the book to actually read. I had to borrow your copy, actually, as you know. I eventually did get it, and I eventually did did read it. And I also, along the way, learned more about Corey Robin. And um, since he teaches uh, in New York City, he's got apparently ter terrific contacts. And he's got a, a wonderful publicist, I would think, because the fanfare that this book has received is mind blowing. As I, I actually opened my review, as you might remember, by commenting on that. 
Yeah. It was re- it was reviewed twice in the New York Times. Uh, Vanity Fair did a piece on it. All the major papers, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, uh, C-SPAN telegra- uh, televised the New York Public Library book launch, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's crazy and good for him. But the, the book is not good. Um, he's a very good writer. And he seemed like a nice guy because I'd email him a couple times to try to get a, co- a review copy of the book. And he tried to help me do it. And eventually I got one. Um, but he writes really well. He's very smart, obviously beautiful credentials. I think Princeton undergrad, I think Yale or Harvard PhD, and he did something at Oxford. So he's obviously very smart. Um, but, you know, my, my take on the book in a sentence is that, uh, uh, leftist political theorists who have no legal training should not write books about judicial opinion. That's my take. Because <laughs> he doesn't understand them. He mischaracterizes them. Sometimes I think deliberately. Other times I think he just doesn't understand it. You know, uh, uh, Justice Thomas is a judge. A judicial opinion is not a poem. It is not a political tract. It is not a novel, all of that. And um, I actually wanted to include a little bit of that in my review, but the editor resisted that because apparently the editor felt that he knows some uh, uh, political scientists, for example, that don't have law degrees that understand the Constitution. Well, maybe, but I still think it, helps when you're going to be writing about judicial opinions to be trained in the law because the constitution is law and clarence thomas approaches it through um theories of uh legal and constitutional interpretation that Corey robin does not mention and does not understand okay yeah the the broad take is that uh he's uh, out of his depth when it when he moves from uh uh, talking about Clarence Thomas's background to interpreting Clarence Thomas's jurisprudence. Uh, I was going to suggest that maybe we take a couple of concrete uh, areas of Thomas. You know, where is Thomas on the Voting Rights Act? Uh, where is Thomas on the Second Amendment? Where is Thomas on freedom of speech? Where is Thomas on originalism? Uh, how do you see Thomas's jurisprudence in those areas? How does Robbins see them? And what's the difference? Okay. Um, Well, the other uh, 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 episode of the Glenn show that we did, we talked a little bit about this and because I I actually wrote the first book about Justice Thomas's legal theory. And that was a long time ago. And I've moved on to other things. But as you might recall, um, in uh, in civil rights uh, cases, uh, Justice Thomas is what I call a liberal originalist. He appeals to the ideal of inherent equality articulated in the Declaration of Independence. In other categories of constitutional law, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, federalism, and the like, he's what I call a a conservative originalist. He's like what Justice Scalia was or what Robert Bork uh, was on the lower court and wanted to be on the Supreme Court had he been confirmed. And that is he kind of tries to identify what the original understanding of the particular phrases is. There's none of that in Robin's book, none of it. And um, uh, Justice Thomas approaches his craft, his responsibility, his duty as a judge through those um, uh, approaches to constitutional interpretation. And of course, other judges have different approaches to interpreting the law, but his is an approach and it's acceptable. But Robin's, Robin's pays no attention to it. It's all sort of um, pop psychology and left wing politics and, 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 and all of that. And, you know, told in a, in a provocative way, the book's easy to read because as I mentioned before, he writes very well and all of that. And I wasn't bored when I read the book, but I was shocked when I read it, frankly. Um, and he just, he mangles, uh, his Justice Thomas's opinions. He does not understand them. You know, this argument, you had mentioned the Second Amendment. He spends almost the entirety of the chapter on the, quote, black constitution, 
talking about Justice Thomas's separate opinion in the um, McDonald versus Chicago Second Amendment case. And his argument is essentially that the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, is central to co- Thomas's um, uh, uh, conception of the black constitution because African Americans need guns so they can shoot white people that are coming for them. You know, that kind of stuff. It's, it's nonsense. What Justice Thomas was really trying to do in his opinion was simply agree with the majority that yes, state and local governments are constrained by the second amendment, just like the federal government is. But he wanted to read the guarantee of the Second Amendment uh, through the lens of the Privileges and Immunities Clause rather than through the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. You're going to need to explain that. Please, okay, please right. explain that. Yeah. So the, the Due Process Clause, uh, w- which the, the Supreme Court has used uh, to recognize uh, the right to privacy, abortion, and all of that, uh, uh has has been turned into a substantive guarantee of autonomy, right? Justice Tom, and it's it it has no potentially no boundaries, and so Justice Thomas's argument is that do, that due process is about procedure, about process, not about substance. Okay, so what he then does is he looks at the privileges and immunities clause of the Fourteenth Amendment, which is about substance. What rights? are fundamental enough to be classified as a privilege or immunity of a citizen of the United States. And he wants to say that the Second Amendment is one of those. And so the states, therefore, and the local governments have to respect it through through that clause in the 14th Amendment. Okay, now in that context, my understanding of Robin's linking of Thomas's position on privilege and immunities as it applies to the Second Amendment to the right to bear arms of linking that to black men's condition in society is that Thomas doesn't believe that black people will ever be free of the threat of white domination, nor does he trust the uh, conventional vehicles of uh, maintenance of order in society, the police and so forth, to guarantee that protection for black men and black women and black children. And therefore, the uh, right to bear arms is critical to African Americans' capacities to be able to fend for themselves in the event that they should need to do so. This is the, as I understand it, correct me if you you have a different understanding, the nature of Robin's argument. And if I understand you, you're saying, well, that's absurd. That's a psycho babble imputation onto Thomas of an interpretation which has a much more conventional uh, constitutional legal justification which is the differences between uh, substantive due process and privilege and immunities with Thomas having uh, a perfectly coherent uh, view about that as a lawyer, not as a black person, as a lawyer, as a judge. Exactly right. And there's a longstanding debate in constitutional history and Supreme Court history about the meaning of the privileges and immunities clause. There's a longstanding debate in constitutional history and uh, in Supreme Court history about whether the due process clause being read substantively like it is, is giving the U.S. Supreme Court the power to, quote, create rights that aren't in the Constitution. And what Justice Thomas did in his separate opinion in the Chicago versus McDonald case is just plant his flag in the privileges and immunities uh, group uh, and reject the substantive due process group. And that's uh, a legitimate, respectable a position for him to take. And that's all he did. This other stuff that Robbins is doing is just frankly loopy. That's all I can think about it. Let, let me give the audience another example. You can comment on this of where I think uh, uh, Corey Robin takes a kind of psychopolitical approach to something which has a much more conventional account in, uh, to try to explain where Clarence Thomas is coming from. And that's the opinions that Thomas has issued, which seem to be supportive of police and incarceration and uh, social control. We can talk about those opinions and parse them, but I just want to get this idea across, which comes across very strongly in Robbins' text. Uh, Because Robbins begins his chapter where he's talking about uh, the white constitution, 
uh, with uh, recalling a section from Thomas's uh, uh, memoir, My Grandfather's Son, where Thomas expresses admiration for his grandfather. His grandfather was stern. His grandfather was tough. His grandfather was a disciplinarian. He was a taskmaster. His grandfather was such a powerful figure in young Clarence Thomas's life that merely a glance from his grandfather could make him cry. Okay, that's a fact reported by Clarence Thomas, recounted by Corey Robin in his book. But Robin then goes on to say, as I read him, the reason that Thomas's jurisprudence is so friendly to a powerful police state and a more authoritarian governance and pro-law enforcement and pro-imprisonment is that he wants the U.S. government through the and, and the state governments through the imposition of law and social control to, in effect, play the role of his, of, of his grandfather in the lives of wayward African-American men who otherwise might not be able to get their stuff together. Thomas, in other words, is writing opinions at the U.S. Supreme Court to try to replicate in U.S. law the, uh, the, the social control and authority within the household and the civil society that he so much admired in his grandfather. Now, that would be worth putting in the newspaper if it were true and you could prove it. I mean, that would be pretty interesting if you had a member of the U.S. Supreme Court, one-ninth of one-third of the American state, replaying his childhood anxieties and his father or grandfather uh, kind of uh, relationships through interpretation of law that was affecting the lives of tens of millions of people. But it struck me as, as, as uh, not, not convincing. I mean, I, again, I, I invite you to comment. Yeah, no, it's not convincing at all. Um, and I agree with your reading of it. And I'll just add a, a little um, uh, nuance or refinement to it or amendment to it. And, and, that, and, and that is that Robbins argues that Thomas wants the government to treat African-Americans terribly. So they turn inward instead of try to participate uh, in, in the broader society. He wants the police to be and, uh, and prison guards and all that to be mean to African-Americans. So African-Americans come to think they can't trust the white man, quote unquote. So they then uh, uh, form strong black communities that are headed by a strong black male. Um, and that's not plausible. It is not plausible. Um, you know, Thomas's opinions on some of these issues, for example, um, whether uh, the, the Eighth Amendment cruel unusual punishment provision protects the conditions of a prisoner while the prisoner is confined, um, uh, is just his reading of the original understanding of the Eighth Amendment. It's not yeah. about this other kind of nonsense uh, to try to get African-American uh, men in particular to distrust the white power government so they'll then retreat to their own communities and do what the powerful male in the household wants them to do. And one of the cases I talk about in my review is that uh, conditions of confinement case in Hudson versus McMillian, where even the New York Times, because it was in Thomas's first term on the court, opined, oh, Justice Thomas is the, quote, youngest, cruelest justice, because he doesn't care that a prison guard popped a prisoner in, in, the, in the mouth and broke his dental plate. That's not what Justice Thomas said. All yeah. he said was that that is wrongful conduct, but it can't be redressed through the Eighth Amendment. It has to be redressed through other things. Yeah. All right. Let me ask you about gender because that also figures very prominently here. We've already touched on that a little bit about uh, Robin uh, understanding Thomas as being concerned to preserve the prerogatives of and the capacities of African-American men. Of course, Clarence Thomas went through an ordeal uh, in his confirmation. He was accused of sexual harassment. There was a hearing before the U.S. Senate. <clears throat> this is all very well known. It, it did scar him. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Uh, Justice Thomas resented it. Uh, he's had occasion from time to time to uh, express that uh, resentment and fury. And in his testimony at the time of his confirmation, he was, uh, you know, unrestrained 
in expressing his fury, his contempt, his rage uh, at the way that he was being treated. Uh, Justice Thomas has, uh, in, prior to coming onto the court, and I don't know about since, but I wouldn't be surprised if so, expressed his concern about the impact of federal transfer programs and welfare on the structure of the African-American family. Uh, he is a religious person. And by the way, Thomas's religion seems not to get much play at all in uh, Robin's book, which is curious because if I were going to have a psychological uh, account of a Supreme Court justice's interpretation of the Constitution, I should think that his religious convictions would be at least as significant in my calculation, Clarence Thomas is a Catholic, uh, the graduate of Holy Cross, the College of Holy Cross. Uh, uh, he is a, uh, you know, he's a conservative, religiously conservative person. I should have thought that his religious views would have figured just as prominently as his racial identity views in any such account. But in any case, what about uh, what about uh, what Robin has to say about the, uh, Thomas's ideas about gender, uh, masculinity, the family? I mean, we, we're living in an age where the African-American family is, you know, uh, troubled. If you uh, measure that by proportion of children born to women who aren't married or whatnot, we have uh, dysfunction at a very high level amongst African-American men. If you measure that by homicide rates or school dropout and failure or incarceration or whatever, um, I think something close to two thirds of college going African-Americans in the United States today are female, uh, et cetera. So, um, uh, what am I trying to ask you? I'm, a, I, I'm asking you to survey and opine about how Robbins uh, understands Thomas's views about gender and how he uses that understanding to interpret Thomas's uh, 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 pronouncements on the court. So are you asking me if, 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 if Justice Thomas thinks that uh, black men should dominate uh, uh, the household, including uh, the women in the household? Is that what I, you're asking? I, I think that's what you think that Robbins thinks about Justice Thomas. Right, right. right. Okay, so I am not asking you whether you agree with that. I'm quite sure that you don't agree with it. But I wanted you, first of all, to articulate what Robbins thinks about Thomas's gender views and then to assess the extent to which Robbins' uh, conclusions concerning Thomas's lawmaking as a judge uh, uh, law interpretation as a judge is influenced by his gender views, if at all. Yeah, you know, my recollection, and I read the book a good while ago, um, and I was focused more on the race part of it, uh, the black constitution, the white constitution, than the gender part of it. But, you know, uh, uh, if my recollection is correct, that Robbins uh, is sort of uh, anti uh uh, female empowerment that women should be subservient and all of that. Uh, th that's ridiculous. Um, uh, I know, uh, uh female, uh, law professors that clerk for him. Uh, and he's, uh, fair to everybody. Uh, uh, <laughs> and I, I know you can't generalize from one anecdote, but I have one anecdote. Uh, w one time, um, he called me. Uh, to talk about a book I was writing at the time. Justice it, Thomas I, called you. Right, because I had sent him an article, and I don't like to bother him because I know he's got a lot to read. That's an understatement. But when I have a book come out, I'll send it to him, because as you know, you don't write a book every year. Um, yeah. But I had a, an, a, an article come out, and it was about the origins of the Georgia judiciary. And so from because he's from Georgia, I thought he might like it. And so – a week earlier, his um, his administrative assistant had called me and said that Justice Thomas was going to give you a call. And so I then had my cell phone with me at all times, obviously, Glenn. And so I was on the 18th tee at the UVA golf course, and my phone rang, and it was Justice Thomas. And he just wanted to talk about the article and what I was working on. He thought it was interesting. But here's the point about gender. Yeah, His wife was you know, trying to call in, you know, how his phone would beep or whatever. Yeah. And so he, he let it go once or twice, but he, he said, Scott, my wife's uh, needs to talk to me. So I, I got to take it. And I said, no problem. Okay. I finished the hole and I was staying across the street. And when I'm putting my golf clubs back in my apartment, 
uh, he calls me back and he said, I don't want you to think I was done with you. So what does that have to do with, with gender? It, he adores his wife. He respects the heck out of his wife. I've been in his office. He has pictures of his wife in there. Um, just like he has a, a bronze bust of his grandfather. So he treats everybody as a human being, as a person of consequence and worth, and he's kind to everybody. And as I think I told you the first time we spoke, he's yeah. by far and away the most popular member of the Supreme Court uh, among the people that work in the Supreme Court, the yeah. people that run the parking garage, the people that clean yeah. the building, and all of that. Uh, and he doesn't care if they're men or women. He just cares that they're people. And he yeah. cares about them as people. You know, Justice Sotomayor, I think, has publicly commented to the same effect. Uh, and let me just mention that Virginia Thomas is white. Uh, and I only mention that because it would appear that Corey Robbins' construction of Clarence Thomas would not admit of the justice having a white wife since he's such an angry, fiery, black nationalist, race-consumed uh, you know, a uh, guy up there on the court. So uh, Robbins doesn't deal with him being a conservative Catholic as far as his interpretation of his uh, jurisprudence. He doesn't deal with him having uh, committed himself for life to a woman who happens to be Caucasian uh, in his uh, interpretation. Those would seem to be anomalous. Anyway, uh, look, I got to go. I got another appointment in a couple of minutes over here. Uh, Scott, thanks for coming on. We know where you stand on impeachment. Uh, good luck with that. I guess you're okay there at Northern Ohio University, but I wouldn't venture anywhere near Georgetown if I were you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we All know right, what well, you think about this book. Uh, let me show it for the last time. This is getting a lot of play. The Enigma of Clarence Thomas. Uh, both my interlocutor here, Scott Gerber, and I have our doubts about the uh, argument, although we do both agree that it is well written. I will give him that. Uh, and uh, Scott, I appreciate you giving us some time here at the Glenn Show. Well, thank you, Glenn. I enjoyed it. Okay. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.